I made a really, really bad mistake. I, I don't even know how to start processing this. I almost don't even know where to begin. I just, I can't, I just can't. <laughs> We nearly lost our boat, babe. Sailing can bite you in the ass yeah. very, very, very quickly. Hi everyone. Today we are sailing to Koh Samui. Not the ideal day to be going anywhere, actually. It's very, very windy, gusting about 30 knots. Maybe not quite 30 knots anymore. Let me just have a look behind me. It's about 16 knots at the moment. I think it's gusting probably about 25. I might be sounding a little bit flat because Last night, we had the most insane, terrifying, mental <laughs> experience that we've ever had on any boat. Um, and I hope that we never do anything like that ever again. I'm not going to go into it now. Nick's uh, helping some of our neighbours just next door with their AIS, so uh, he's just off the boat right now. And I think that we need to sit down and um, talk to you about it together. Yeah, just still processing, still processing what happened and why. Okay, just wanted to clarify why I sound a bit distracted. Anyway, so that's on my mind and uh, I'm, I'm just trying to like get myself out of it, but I'm just, yeah, fully freaked out. So anyway, once Nick gets back from our friends, we're off to Koh Samui and I'll be glad to get out of this place because we have had several near disasters in the last couple of days since being angered here and um, fr frankly I'll be I'll be glad to leave. I'm Teresa, this is Nick and this is Ruby Rose 2, our floating home. Join us as we settle into life on board our brand new catamaran, documenting our adventures and never shying away from the reality of boat life. Subscribe to our channel and leave a comment because we love to hear from you and a big thanks to our community of patrons. We were so glad to leave this anchorage on Koh Panyan, which had up until 48 hours ago been our favorite. But a couple of frankly terrifying incidents had left us shaken and keen to leave. The weather seemed to reflect our mood. We'd been enjoying blue skies and warm sunshine for months and now the change of the seasons was definitely upon us with windy wild weather and gray lumpy seas. The sooner we could get back to the relative security of Koh Samui so we could provision and prepare for our overnight passage north to Pattaya, the better. That was a bouncy couple of hours. I'll be glad to get in, get the anchors set and uh, probably just decompress. <laughs> We had a few things go flying uh, when we got hit by a couple of particularly big waves. So do a bit of cleaning up, have a cup of tea and just, I don't know, try and have a calm afternoon. That's the plan. It's very windy. <laughs> But our anchor is set. We've got plenty of scope out. Oof. And uh, the boat feels comfortable. I'm literally getting blown over with the wind right now. Woo! All right, we're anchored. We're safe. We made it. I guess now is the time to have a little chat about what has been happening over the last couple of days because we have had a very, very exciting 48 hours and <laughs> I almost don't even know where to begin. When the first incident happened, I thought that makes for a good story. Okay, it was stressful at the time, but now we can look back on it and say, remember that time when dot, dot, dot. 
And then the second incident happened and I am still recovering from that. And I think I will be recovering for a long time. I mean, I can't even, yeah, it was just mental. So let's go back two days ago and talk about the first drama that happened. There's an actual beach in our dinghy. The hapless disasters that seem to happen at the most inopportune moments. And I'm going to preface this whole story. And you'd preface it by something. By saying that I'm pretty f <laughs> No, I've been at it for like three hours. So listen, we went to the a beach bar. We went ashore with our friends and there was a bit of swell and they said, we'll meet you there. And their dinghy was already up on the sand as we were kind of circling, trying to find somewhere to land. And we were like, oh, well, they did it, we can do it too. And so we managed to land the dinghy, no problem. We dragged the dinghy up the beach with the help of a couple of guys from the hotel. Left the dinghies for three hours. We went to a bar on the beach, but it was just around the corner, so we didn't have line of sight of our dinghies. And I said, okay, I just need to run back to the dinghy to get my shoes. The beach is like pitch black. There's no restaurants or anything on the beach. And I see these two shapes in the water. Theresa ran back said the dinghies are, are f I got to the dinghies and they were both sideways to the actual water. They were having waves crashing into them. Sideways with the waves crashing over the side. And they were full of water. And I do mean full of water. When Theresa runs, there's a problem. I was like... We're like, oh, f the dinghy must have weighed like a literal ton. The four of us ran back. We assisted each other in getting the dinghy. We met in getting our dinghies righted. It was a hectic, hectic 15 minutes trying to get the dinghies up, like floating again away from the crashing waves out because they were just so heavy that we couldn't really move them. We tried pulling them up, not going to happen. We ended up having to push them out to sea full of water, which was traumatic. Once we got the dinghy facing into the waves, every time a wave came in, the, it kind of lifted the dinghy up a little bit. So we're able to pull the dinghy out with each wave. We got our dinghy started first. Teresa then swam back to Roger and Tina to make sure that they, because she's a she is a much stronger swimmer than I. Roger and Tina were like struggling. They had a dog. Roger actually was underneath the dinghy and a wave came up, lifted the dinghy up and it landed on his head. And I was like, oh my God, like we're about to deal with an unconscious person. Luckily he's obviously like <laughs> tougher than he looks. I mean, he looks pretty tough. I helped them out and they had a dog that they were trying to like get in the dinghy. And my God, it was just mental. And then kind of put it back at like, two knots because we've got 500 kilos of water in the dinghy, or probably a lot more. And then we've now just spent like the last half an hour bailing with a bucket. And tomorrow we've probably have 30, 40, 50 kilos of sand in the dinghy. Like what f day then? We're sitting there congratulating ourselves. Like, oh, have we done f***ing well? None of this bollocks. We haven't f***ing like broken anything, f anything for the day. And then we get back to this and all of a sudden, wallop, we've got like in high filled jacuzzis. Do you know the worst part of the whole thing? We didn't get any dinner. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, that was bad enough. The dinghy flooding with water was plenty of drama for me. We went to bed that night and we were like, that was kind of hilarious, like super stressful in the moment, but we got the dinghy back to the boat. It's full of sand. It will probably be full of sand forever, but no harm was done. Everyone survived. It's okay. And then 24 hours later, almost to the minute, this happened. The craziest thing of my entire life just happened and I'm freaking the out. And I will explain all in a minute. I just, I can't, I just can't. So we said we were going to fill you guys in on what happened. So now's as good a time as any. <laughs> Nick, why don't you set the scene? So we ended up on the island of Koh Panyang and the boat was fine for two days. We met up with another boat. We went ashore for drinks, probably about 7 p.m. 
And I might say that day it was gusting 25 yeah. knots. Yeah, it was gusting yeah. 25 knots. So it was 25 knots all afternoon, but on the boat it didn't move an inch. We then, about 9 pm, about an hour and a half after dark, we zip back to the dinghy and I kept saying to Teresa where's our anchor light and she kept saying to me you can't see it because there's boats in the way there's fishing boats and you're just you, you've got light pollution and I'm like our boat's not there our boat is not there so then I was like well maybe I just didn't turn the anchor light on so we were thinking about that yeah. but then there's another anchor light out to sea now because I am always paranoid about not being able to find our boat I always leave the transom steps on all the transom step lights on and there's four lights on each transom so a long way out to sea i could see this anchor light and then i could suddenly see transom steps and i'm like jesus christ and i'm like i don't i i think i was in denial i'm like that's not that no that can't be and i said to nick check thankfully we have the sentinel app i said check the sentinel app because I don't know what that is out there, but it can't be our boat. That being said, our boat's clearly not where we left it, so. <laughs> so we checked the Sentinel app and the Sentinel app had gone off. And our boat was about j just over one nautical mile out to sea. Now at this point, like all hell breaks loose in my head. We turned the dinghy and luckily I'd filled the dinghy up with fuel towards our boat and zipped off at like probably 20 knots. Now at this point I said to Teresa, please call the other boat and tell them what's going on. We need someone to have eyes on us. And as soon as we left the seclusion and the protection of this bay we were in, like the waves were up. And I'm not, I'm not embellishing it. I'm not about this, like this is bad. We're getting hit on a beam sea and the boat is taking off and it felt like it was gonna flip. And I actually slowed the boat down at one point and I thought yeah. if we flip this, we're dead. That's it, we're, we're dead. Yeah. The boat comes into view. We could then see it is our boat. But the whole point is, at this point, I'm thinking to myself, has it been stolen? Yeah. Or is it just drifted off? So we get to the boat. We literally yeah. get to the back of our boat. And it was pretty sketchy in a pretty bumpy sea. I think the swirl was about a metre and it was short chop. Trying to get the dinghy attached back to the uh back onto the boat so we tied the painter off mm. and then we realized we literally had to lift the dinghy yeah so we're literally trying to get the davit lines down what i said to Therese is like get on board get the torch check the back of the boat make sure there's no lines in the water and get those engines started so she ran onto the boat got onto the boat while i was just trying to feed the davit lines got the torch we always thankfully keep the torch in the same position there was no one on board thank god because it was running through my head i'm like my like yeah what do we do with this pirates get the dinghy up Okay. Okay. Can't see anything. Tell me where I'm going. Well, use the chart to get go back into the bay. Okay. Do you want me to helm? Are you, or are you okay? I'm okay. Okay. So we get the boat started. We get the davits. The the dinghy pulled up. Teresa then ran foot ran forward to look to see if we lost the anchor. Did the anchor come off? We've still got the anchor. It's just dragged. The bridle off. is still attached. And so we haul anchor up take the bridle off haul the rest of the anchor up start the engine and then we're like literally punching back into at this point i think we have 30 knots tina called they know we're out here yeah i've i've called i spoke to her okay. i told her that um i said can you see our anchor light and she said i think so i said we're here and we're going to make our way back into the this is to stay up. i have there's they're literally on their boat right now looking at us i told her just to wait until we're in and i'll let her know when we get back in i don't know what happened Okay, we'll, we'll debrief later. We then uh, get the boat anchored and just sat there like, I, I don't even think shock was like, it, like I don't, it, shock takes a while to sit in and I'm still not sure it's, I'm even processing this. I, I don't even know how to start processing this. I don't. I, I, we have been we lived on a boat and lived at anchor for two years. We've never found our boat a mile out to sea. I think we're both in in shock at all this. Uh, we had 35 meters of chain in five meters of water. We had a seven to one scope. The anchor had been set for two days. I don't know. Either someone 
someone anchored very, very close to us may have dislodged our anchor and let the boat drag. It could be that because we're using eight mil chain, it's just we need more scope out. I don't know. I think we're both. Well, I'll take a positive. We work well as a team when it needs to be done. I think, you know, we both, both went into panic mode and no, we both went into adrenaline mode and actually worked pretty f***ing well. No one flapped. But no, I flapped. No, you didn't, Buzz. You didn't. You didn't. You didn't. You didn't flap. You did incredibly well. I think the whole... Like, f*** me ragged. You didn't flap. You did exceedingly well in probably one of the most stressful situations of your entire life. Okay? Come in. Come in. Come on. Hey. This is why you never anchor on a lee shore. So now you lose your boat. We nearly lost our boat, babe. Uh, yeah, we did. Yes, we did. Like, we 100% nearly lost our boat. I understand where you're coming from, right? And... Look, though, I'm trying to process all this bullshit. I don't get it. I don't, I don't get, get it. Seven, seven times scope. We've been here for three days. Yes. The wind has not particularly, I mean, it's not picked up considerably. I mean, it's still... Oh, it's 13 knots at the moment. 12 knots, 13 knots. It's 13 gusting 20. It's, 30, it's been 13 gusting 25 for three days. What the f*** did our anchor suddenly decide when the wind hasn't shifted direction either? No. The wind has been blowing exactly this way for three days. Why the f*** did our anchor suddenly decide to drag? I was so... I think we were both so emotionally fried. It's super, super important that we understand what we did wrong. And I think we got it. And the blame here is 100% mine. As a skipper of any boat, you're to blame for this. And we're not casting blame. I'm just telling you that the blame is mine. I I'm just going to say, once you've heard all of this, then you can comment below, particularly if you're an experienced sailor, and let us know whether it could have happened to you. So, we anchored in five meters of water and put 30 meters of chain out, six times scope, wallop, done, boat set. We always sit on the anchor, we bed it in. We literally bed the anchor in by putting the bridle on and reversing hard. That anchor was dug in, that's grand. So we knew the anchor was dug in. It had been like that for two days. What did we do wrong with six times scope? This is what we did wrong. The first thing is that we had a very, very, very big spring tide. And that gave us about six meters of water. That gives us another meter of tide. So we're now at six meters. So that then takes our scope down to five times. And you think, well, that's all right. But this is the f And this is the f that just completely this was the missing piece of the puzzle it completely slipped my mind yeah and at three o'clock on the morning of that i was sat up here on anchor watch i'm like you muppet <laughs> when we took delivery of the boat phil the delivery skipper who had set the boat up said i put a 1.5 meter offset on the depth gauge so that you know when the boat is aground and you don't not the depth of the water it's a depth under the keel and i went all right yeah i accepted that absolutely we never had it on ruby rose because i never wanted it we had a lift keel so i'm like all my calculations are out by 1.2 well it's actually 1.2 meters all my calculations are out by 1.2 meters so now in five meters of water with 30 meters of chain we've gone to six meters of water with 30 meters of chain but we've now got like 1.2 more meters now we're looking at four times scope so we've now we've now our scope we're up we're shit out of luck on scope yeah like we want yep. five to seven the wind picks up yep. from 20 knots to 30 knots and in addition to that one final final thing this boat carries an absolute shit ton of windage and we dragged our anchor 
It is a minor miracle that we managed to just get that boat back. I can only imagine, I mean, the phone C went and said, you know that lovely boat we had, we lost it. Uh, where'd you go? Well, I don't know, it's gone. It's gone, it has gone. So this is the whole thing. We made a mistake, we made a f***ing awful mistake. A really, no, I, I made a really, really bad mistake. We There's... both did because I also didn't think about the fact it was spring tides and that we had, and we knew that there was a massive tidal range because the night before we'd almost, well, we hadn't sunk our dinghy, but our dinghy filled up with water because we massively miscalculated by how much the tide was gonna come in to the beach that night. So we knew that there was a huge tidal range. We just didn't think to convert that knowledge into, okay, what do we do about our boat and should we put out some more scope? We were lulled into a false sense of security because that day we'd been sitting here all afternoon with 25 knots yeah. consistently. I think we're both are still, I'm pretty shaken up by all this. I am still, it's still like, it's gonna haunt me for a long while. Yeah. Luckily, no damage was done, but what lessons do we take out of this? Firstly, if you are chartering a boat, if you are chartering anywhere and it's not your boat, understand if there is a keel offset when you are setting your anchor. That for us, that 1.2 meters was the difference between staying put and dragging the anchor. Number two, I need to rethink my whole thing about not having my phone on or not looking at my phone when I'm at dinner with people. While that boat, while I have anchor alarms, or remote anchor alarms on, on the phone. I didn't take into account the fact that it was a big spring and I should have just paid out more chain. I should have done. Full sense of security. And yeah. essentially the, the fault is all mine. Please comment down below. Please do. I look, don't, you know, you can give me a shoeing if you need on the internet. I, you know, I beat myself up probably enough over this and will continue to over, t over time. What I will say is that I'm so glad though because I, I got up the next morning, because Nick slept up here. I said, when I say slept, we didn't really sleep. We kind of fitfully dozed. And as Nick said, it was gusting high 30s overnight. So, you know, even had we not dried, we probably wouldn't have slept that night anyway. Regardless, um, I got up the next morning ready to like have my second meltdown over this. And I just said to Nick, I don't understand what happened. What happened? How did we drag having stayed put all day yesterday during 25 knots of wind, how is it that we suddenly dragged? And when he said, I know the answer to that, I know what went wrong, and he explained about the offset, I was just like, my, my initial feeling was relief, because suddenly it made sense. And I'm like, thank God there's an actual explanation, because if we hadn't been able to figure it out, then that would have haunted me for the yeah. rest of my life. Yeah, it's pretty, not humbling, but you, Sailing can bite you in the ass yep. very, very, very quickly. That's our episode. Uh, leave your comments down below. I think that we've all got anchor hor horrific anchoring stories. If you can beat us with your anchor story, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got the best one, short of someone literally losing their boat. That's but not funny, what are you laughing No, that's already? not funny at all. <laughs> all right, listen, take care. We'll be back next week, hopefully with an intact boat. All the best, bye-bye.